Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, we'd be glad to hear from you if you want to ask them here. You can also call to disagree with the host if you'd like. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. And as was the case at the beginning of the show yesterday, there are a few lines still open. That's not always the case, but that's a special opportunity for those of you who always seem to not be able to get through when you call. There's some lines open now. The number is 844-484-5737. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, we have a couple of uh, meetings in Temecula in Southern California. If you are in Southern California, feel free to join us there. Tomorrow morning, we have a men's Bible study uh, in Temecula. And then tomorrow night, we have a uh, open to anybody uh, question and answer time in the same location in Temecula. So if you uh, want to go there or want to look into it, you can go to the narrowpath.com and, uh, and go into announcements and you'll find the time and place for these gatherings. All right. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now and talk to, uh, looks like it's Janine, perhaps from Roland Heights, uh, California. Welcome to the narrow path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm calling today about First Peter three eighteen and nineteen, uh, oh. which says which says Jesus spoke to the spirits in prison after his death. I'm an ex Mormon, and I know what they how they wrongly interpret this passage, uh, but I'm wondering uh, what you have to say about it. Yeah. Who, now, were you who, who were you he? reading were you reading from uh, some translation, or were you paraphrasing it just from your memory? I, I'm sorry, I was paraphrasing. Uh, okay, yeah, that's, it's, fine. Uh, that's fine. I, yeah, I, I have, just I had the new, new American yeah, standard. I, I just yeah, I wondered if there was any translation that rendered it as you did because this the phrase after his death is not in the passage, and many times and people those, many times people assume that what is being described there is something that took place while Jesus was in the grave for three days, but it doesn't say that exactly. What it says is this: it says uh, at the end of verse. Uh, 18, it mentions the Spirit, and in verse 19 it says, by whom, that is by the Spirit, he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Now, we are told that Jesus, uh, through his Spirit, went and preached to disobedient souls in prison. Uh, souls who are now in prison. We don't know if they were in prison at the time that they were being preached to, but he's talking about people who are now dead and now are in Hades. I'm sure that most people would understand it that way. But most people, or a lot of people anyway, also seem to think that it's describing something Jesus did uh, when he died, That he, the assumption being that he went, his spirit went down into Hades, where the other spirits in prison are, and he preached to those who were down there. Now, uh, this is not referring to preaching to righteous people who have died. It's talking about those who are disobedient. So uh, if, if this is what it's saying, then we'd have to assume that Jesus went down into Hades and um, preached to bad people who had died previously to his death, Old Testament people perhaps, and, uh, and that he preached something to them. Some say he preached the gospel to them. Some would say he preached his victory to them, not giving them necessarily an opportunity to repent, but just you know, rubbing it in their face. However, that's reading, both of those ideas are reading something into the passage that simply isn't stated. It says that the people that were preached to, the people who are now in prison, but who were preached to, were disobedient in the days of Noah while he was preparing the ark. That, it doesn't talk about all bad people from the Old Testament times. Uh, it doesn't talk about you know people after Noah's time. It talks about specifically the people who were disobedient while Noah was building his ark. And it's saying that uh, they are the ones that Jesus preached to. Their souls are now in prison. But while Noah was building the ark, they, they were not in prison. They were alive. Um, and, but they were disobedient at that time, the Bible says. 
Now, there's a possibility that what Peter is saying is that Jesus did this through his spirit, speaking through the prophet Noah. Uh, one reason for thinking this is because earlier in chapter 1 of, of uh, 1 Peter, just two chapters earlier, he referred to the spirit that was in the prophets in the Old Testament as the spirit of Christ. That's in 1 Peter 1, 11. So he said that the spirit that spoke through the Old Testament prophets was the spirit of Christ. Now, Noah was an Old Testament prophet, and therefore, Peter would, would be inclined to say that, Peter, that Noah spoke through the spirit of Christ. So when he says that Jesus, through his spirit, preached to those who were disobedient while Noah was uh, preparing the ark, he could mean that Noah preached to those while he was building the ark. He, he was preaching to the rebellious neighbors as he built the ark, and that was the spirit of Christ speaking through him. Jesus was preaching through his spirit, through his, uh, his prophet Noah. This then would not be referring to anything that happened when Jesus was in the grave or even, even, even after Jesus had been born, but basically saying the spirit of Christ existed in the Old Testament times, spoke through prophets and people like Noah, and, uh, and it was people in Noah's day that were preached to uh, by Noah through the spirit of Christ. And so Jesus, in a sense, by his spirit preached to them. That's, that's uh, one way to make sense of the thing. And, and there's two cross-references that Peter uh, uses, or that he doesn't use, but I would use to tr suggest this is probably what he means. One is what I already mentioned in chapter 1, verse 11. He already referred to the Spirit speaking through the prophets as the Spirit of Christ. And the other is that in uh, chapter 2 of Second Peter, his, the, the next epistle of Peter, uh, it says that, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, that's not saying all the same things he says in the passage we're looking at, but there's no place else in the Bible that mentions Noah being a preacher at all. Uh, the Bible does not mention Noah preaching in, the, in Genesis, for example, where Noah's story is on. There's no mention of him preaching to anybody. Um, the New Testament does not refer to him preaching to anybody, though he is mentioned in the Olivet Discourse and a few other places in the New Testament. Uh, he's never said to be a preacher. Only Peter describes Noah as a preacher, and that's in Second Peter two five. So we know that uh, Peter. We don't we don't know how many other people who wrote in the New Testament did, but Peter uh, regarded uh, Noah's activities while he was building the ark to be preaching, preaching righteousness. And if he believed that he was preaching inspired preaching through the Spirit of Christ, he might well be speaking therefore of that when he says that Jesus through His Spirit preached to the disobedient who were disobedient in Noah's day while he was uh, building the ark, it would suggest that Noah was doing the preaching and the Spirit of Christ was preaching through him. And it would not be actually telling us anything at all about what happened in the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. And I'm inclined myself to see it that way, though I've been taught it otherwise. Many times, actually. <laughs> all right. Hello. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your ministry. Thank you. I appreciate your call. Um, okay, let's talk to uh, Cedric from Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, since he's from Corvallis, I think this is probably Cedric who's been calling me for years, but not very often. Hi, Cedric. Is that you? Uh, hi, Steve. How are you? It is. It's okay, always good when I, can, when I can give you a call. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually have two questions today, both, um, again, in the, in the, about the subject of biblical justice. Um, one is a very quick one. You uh -huh. had a caller, and you'll remember this one. A caller recently uh, confessed that he purposely committed murder many years ago, um, and he had repented of that and come to Christ. Uh, <clears throat> and my question to you about that relative to biblical justice, he asked if there was anything he needed to do, and you told him that he was forgiven, which absolutely is true. But uh, you asked him if if the law was after him, and, and, and he said, oh, no, no, no. But I'm wondering, if the law was not after him because they didn't know he did it, is there any responsibility that he has? Well, that's a good question. I, uh, I honestly didn't uh, inquire more for more details, so there might be details I don't uh, – there are obviously right. details I don't know, and which could affect right. it. I think that uh, a Christian who has committed a crime um, – 
and the law is still, it's an unsolved crime. But uh, I, I personally think he should, no doubt, go and turn himself in. I don't have okay. any real, um, you know, direct statements of Scripture about this. I do know that, for example, Onesimus had fled from Philemon, which uh, Onesimus was a slave and runaway. And uh, as I understand it, under Roman law, it, uh, a runaway slave, if captured, could be executed. So he, you know, perhaps he was guilty of a capital crime. And, you know, Paul sent him back to turn himself in. Um, so, I mean, that would suggest that Paul thought that you shouldn't leave those kinds of things unsettled. Now, of course, God forgives, but if the state hasn't forgiven, then I think going back and turning yourself in is a, is, is a, is a good thing to do. And I have to say, I've known <laughs> people who've committed lesser crimes than, um, than murder, who have gotten saved uh, through oh, our outreaches in Santa Cruz, for example. One guy from Canada was there, and when he, when he came to Christ, he told me that he's, he's wanted for certain crimes up there. And I told him he really should go back and turn himself in. And he did. And, and they let him off. I mean, God, God didn't want him to go to prison, apparently, so he got let off. Um, so I would, I would think that, of course, murder is a much more severe thing, but you know, the Bible says that uh, the shedding of innocent blood is something that uh, defiles a land and that mm -hmm. it, and uh, defilement cannot be removed by anything other than the, the blood of the one who, 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 who is the manslayer. Uh, in other words, capital punishment. Now, in many states, there is no capital punishment. So, you know, that's not his fault if he turns himself in and gets prison time instead. But uh, a Christian should be willing to you know, die or go to prison for, for taking a righteous position. And mm -hmm. I, one thing I didn't mention to him, and I because I didn't inquire any further than I did, but there may be things that a murderer, when he repents, needs to do uh, in addition to simply repenting and, and having God's forgiveness, and that would be to right. make a restitution. I mean, for example, if, if I murdered somebody and that person had a, some dependents, a wife and children, for example, uh, then my obligation may be, after I've repented, to uh, make sure that they're cared for, even if I have to financially you know, care for them myself. That's what restitution would mean, is that you do anything you can to undo the damage uh, that you've caused for victims. Now, of course, the murder victim, you can't do anything for him once he's dead, but there may be other victims. His family uh, is certainly victimized by a murder. So yeah. it is, the, the yeah. subject is a little more complicated, it's true, but, uh, and, and some circumstances that may have prevailed in his case perhaps would have required you know, more detailed counsel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, that's, that's where my mind went was responsibility to the family. Um, yeah. Potentially. And right. so my second, my second question, and I'm going to ask, I've called about this topic before, so I'm going to ask that you suspend your thoughts of what you or your, your circle of friends have personally experienced and, and just think about it um, uh, independently, I guess. So what does the Bible call a local church to do on a practical level if that church recognizes past or present injustices or inequity along racial lines in their local area or state, um, in areas like economics, housing, education, criminal, criminal justice system, whatever? If, if the church does recognize and acknowledge um, injustices, what should the local church do under biblical justice? Well, every, every church should stand for justice, okay? In other words, if there is corruption, if there's injustice, the church should decry it because Jesus said that justice is one of the weightier matters of the law. He, he condemned the Pharisees because they kept little laws like paying tithes, but neglected right. weightier matters of the law like justice, he said. Uh, justice is on the short list of things that God requires Christians to stand for. As it says in Micah 6, 8, he showed you, O man, what is good, that you do justly and love mercy, love mercy. and walk humbly with your God. So, I mean, any, anybody who does not stand for justice is not standing for God's 
concerns because God, the Bible says, the the just God loves justice. Um, so the church should speak out against injustice. Now, if you're talking about uh, justice that the church itself perpetrated, then of course the church no. has to repent, has to repent of that. I mean, sometimes right. churches have uh, perpetrated injustice, and they should certainly uh, repent. Um, but if if we're talking about a church that has not itself perpetrated injustice, but it's living in a community where injustice prevails, uh, then I would think the church needs to speak out against injustice. Now, as far as the church being obligated, let's say, to go to the politicians or the you know criminal justice uh, you know people or police or courts or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and confront them and stick stick our fingers in their face and say hey you're doing injustice that would not be ob it's not necessarily obvious that we are to to do exactly that <coughs> because we're not technically responsible for what they have done and you remember G Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 I'm sorry 1 Corinthians 5 he said uh, what have i to do with judging those who are outside the church uh, god mm -hmm. judges them we have to judge those who are inside the church. So <clears throat> while while we need to speak out to the public and raise their consciousness of what biblical justice is so that people <clears throat> stop doing unjust things, for us to go and, uh, and and condemn some particular politician or policeman or, or judge, uh, that's, if, if they're not in the church, that's, Paul said, that's not really mine to judge them. Uh, I'm, they don't answer to me. The answer to God, but all people will answer to God for whether they're doing justice or not. When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations and teach them to observe everything I've commanded, certainly that would mean that we need to teach the nations what God requires in terms of justice. So the church has got to, is an educational institution. You know, we teach the nations, we teach them to observe. Uh, <laughs> we don't, uh, they don't answer to us in the sense that, uh, you know, a man answers to some authority over him. We're not, we're not authorities over them, but we are servants. The church is a servant to the community and a community that's bringing God's judgment upon itself through its own ignorance of justice certainly is best served by the church if we would teach them what justice requires, what it is. So you mentioned that the church is not necessarily to go to the local politician or, or police force or whoever it is, <clears throat> uh, bank, uh, whoever it is. But then what does it look like practically for the church to speak out? Well, they need to, first of all, teach their own members what justice is. That's discipling okay. the Christians. You, know, you have to disciple them. Uh, the preachers of the church are not necessarily the ones who are going to reach all the people because preachers in the church often are just reaching the congregation. But out in the workplace and the schools and the, and the marketplace, uh, Christians themselves <coughs> are supposed to be a witness. And the, the pastors and teachers, the Bible says, uh, equip the saints, that is the church members, for the work of the ministry uh, and the edifying of the body of Christ. So I think that Christians... The, the rank and file of Christians should not count on their pastors to go out and find, you know, the the, the unjust uh, judge or the unjust shop owners or the unjust banks or whatever, or the unjust right. I agree. universities. <clears throat> but it is a place for the, it's the voice of Christians that is to elevate the conscience of society about these things. Now, when I said it's not necessarily our job to go and speak to specific politicians, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying that okay. no, I don't think anyone could say we are remiss in our duty if some corrupt politician never gets a, you know, gets a face-to-face -face confrontation from us. But some may feel called to do that kind of thing. But again, it would be to educate, not to necessarily condemn, because we're, we don't judge those who are outside. Uh, we, but we can certainly point out to them that they are not doing the right thing and that what, what is right in the sight of God is such and so. I mean, we are to be instructing the world about justice. Right. And I, I maybe I know we're running short on time. It's the instructing the world and how we go about doing that. Because again, in my example, the church has acknowledged and 
and acknowledge to the congregation and, and the congregation as a whole has acknowledged the injustice. Now, what are we to do about it? Um, and that's really what I'm... <clears throat> well, what we're supposed to do about it is to do justly. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, if Christians will act in justice, that's all they really can do. You can't make somebody else do a just thing. Uh, sure. Unless we, you know, set up our own government with our own police and go out there and, and force people to do, you know, what what Christians are supposed to do. But Jesus and the Apostle Paul and, and others in the early church never made it their mission to go out and force pagans to act like Christians. I mean, it's, it's for Christians right. to act like Christians. Now, hopefully, if the church is doing its job, the number of Christians are going to be increasing in the society, and therefore the influence of Christians will increase. Uh, I was just, uh, I heard some show today where someone called in who was a, uh, a conservative school teacher in the public schools. And I was just thinking, well, I wonder what it's like for that person when they're in the, you know, the break room with the other teachers and so forth, and, and they're all talking about their left-wing politics. Uh, you know, what, what mm -hmm. does this person say? And I don't know if she says anything at all. Or maybe she does or mm -hmm. doesn't. But, uh, but many Christians would, and many probably would not. But it's the voice and the testimony of Christians in those kinds of places, rather than, uh, rather than you know, the clergy, you know, making laws for unbelievers to follow. I mean, it's it's really the right. voice and influence of Christians that that is the hope of a just society. You can, we right. can tell them what justice is. We can't force them to do it. That's what the police are for. But right. but the police don't answer to the church. They answer to secular government. Right. What made me think of this is the last time we did talk, you had acknowledged uh, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail calling upon white churches to get involved. And back then, they were marching. Uh, they had sit-ins, things like that. Um, I, I don't see the, the church, it being appropriate for the church, getting involved in the marches that are going on today, most of them anyway. Um, so well, I was not the, looking not for the ones that are burning right. down buildings, yeah. I mean, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think Christians, yeah, um, I think Christians should be willing to march uh, for any righteous cause um, mm -hmm. as Christians. See, uh, I, I don't think we're supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers in, a, in the work of the kingdom. I think right. that the church has a, a, enough members of its own that they can, in the name of Jesus, protest um, abortion or, or racism or, or any other thing. That needs to be, mm -hmm. you know, brought to the consciousness of the public. I, I know there's a lot of secular people concerned about these things, and a lot of Christians mm -hmm. just join with them. I, I, you know, I don't know if it's wrong for right. Christians to march with them, but it doesn't. When Christians are marching with a, a movement or a uh, an organized, uh, you know, protest that isn't sponsored by Christ's people, uh, then any good they're doing, any voice that they're speaking to the community is not in the name of Christ, and therefore it's not specifically glorifying him. Whereas Christians, if Christians as Christians are marching and, and, and speaking up for the cause of, of Christ and justice and righteousness and so forth, then I think that that's, uh, that's a fine thing to do. I mean, I, I don't know that people who don't do it are necessarily remiss because I don't know of any time that the early church you know, had these marches and so forth, but they did do righteousness. And like leaven in a lump of dough, their righteousness, you know, uh, elevated the concerns of society. That's why gladiatorial games were discontinued, a horrible means of entertainment, but it was the Christian witness against them. Uh, and, you know, you know, the right, rights of human life, uh, the consciousness of the Roman Empire was uh, elevated by the fact that Christians would rescue uh, discarded babies who were left out to die of exposure and so forth. I mean, the Christian alternative, right. the Christian alternative in society was visible because all Christians practiced the righteousness that, uh, <clears throat> that Christ taught. Uh, we don't have that right now. We have Christians who do and Christians who don't, or at least people who call themselves Christians who don't. And that makes it much more difficult for us to be a united witness for society. I mean, for example, if, if a group of godly Christians organized a march, uh, let's say, against abortion, you might mm -hmm. find another church in town organizing a march for abortion, you know? So you've got this disunity of the testimony. But 
Of course, those who are marching right. for abortion certainly don't have any connection with, with anything Jesus taught. But they, but they nonetheless regard themselves as Jesus change agents in the world or whatever, even if they're, even if they don't believe what Jesus said. Uh, right. <laughs> anyway, um, Steve, sure. I appreciate it. You've given me a very generous amount of time for my questions, and uh, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and I, I enjoy listening to the show. Um, and hey, I, Cedric, I really thank appreciate you. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Have you have you uh, read my new book, uh, books on the kingdom of God? I have not yet, but the, I will I, have them on order hopefully this weekend. Okay, there are chapters in them about justice, right? And uh, I mean, it's kind of a main uh, a main focus of the books. So uh, I just right. thought you might be interested. All right, well, good yeah, talk you, to you, Cedric. Okay, thank we'll you. Talk Steve. again. God bless you. God bless you too. Bye now. Well, we've got another half hour coming up. If you can hear the music in the background, you might think, "Oh, oh, we're over." We are not. This is just the break at the bottom of the hour where I tell you that The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. We pay thousands of dollars to radio stations so that people can hear us on the radio and call in. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can uh, write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593, or go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Don't go away. The book of Hebrews tells us, do not forget to do good and to share with others. So let's all do good and share the narrow path with Steve Gregg with family and friends. When the show is over today, tell one and all to go to thenarrowpath.com where they can study, learn, and enjoy with free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse -verse teachings, and archives of all the Narrow Path radio shows. And be sure to tell them to tune into the show right here on the radio. Share listener-supported The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Share and do good. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or Christianity you want to ask, feel free to do that. Or you can call to disagree with the host if you have a point of disagreement. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. And I'll announce this again since we have some new listeners perhaps tuning in at this time. Uh, if you're in Southern California, about once a month, well, actually right now it is exactly once a month, the first uh, Saturday of each month, we have two meetings in Temecula. One is a morning Bible study for men, and, uh, and it, only men, uh, biological men, you know, uh, it's for them. And then in the evening, we have an open public meeting in the same location, for anybody, and that's a Q&A. That's uh, tomorrow is happening, tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening. And um, you can find out the time and the place of those meetings at uh, thenarrowpath.com under the tab that says Announcements. We'd love to see you if you want to join us there. All right, let's uh, talk to some more callers here. Let's talk to Carl from uh, La Mesa, California. Carl, welcome to The Narrow Path. Hello, Steve. Uh I have a question here. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Julie Webby or not, but uh, she's on the Internet, and she claims to be sort of a prophet. She doesn't use the term prophetess, but she claims to be speaking for God all the time. She's got quite an extensive uh, amount of posts on her various media. And uh, one of the things she's claiming is that the, uh, the uh, vaccine is... Uh, will alter your DNA and that you will no longer be fully human unless you will be rejected by God. And uh, first, you know, two questions come up. One is, uh, you know, is God speaking detailed things like this through people today? And number two, is this, uh, this thing she's saying have any validity to it? Well, first, I'm not familiar with her at all, so I don't know anything about her spiritual credentials or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of people that God is speaking those specific things through, but there may there might be some. Um, however, I wouldn't agree with her statement necessarily that God will reject you if you get the vaccine. Uh, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of rumors out there on online on the internet that talk about nefarious uh, purposes of the vaccine, 
and uh, and some talk about there being nanobots or a chip or uh, some kind of uh, a DNA altering uh, you know technology that's being injected with this stuff. And uh, I mean, it sounds pretty science fictiony to me. Uh, it may be true because a lot of things that are true sound science fiction to me. But uh, I I would. Uh, I would certainly not make such bold statements as what she's saying, that if you take the vaccine, you know, you're going to become less than human. Uh, it'll alter your DNA or whatever. Um, it, and, you know, I've heard, I've heard that this could be true. But, I, but on the other hand, I know that vaccines have been made by several different companies. And I don't know that they're identical. So, I mean, I'm, it, it seems to me if someone is saying take a vaccine and some uh, insidious uh, plot of uh, Bill Gates is going to uh, invade your life through a, a nanochip or something. Um, is that true of all the vaccines? I wonder. I don't really. Uh, I, I can't say that this these rumors are not true because I don't know enough about it. Frankly, I'm not very interested in it. Um, I am pretty interested in avoiding vaccines in general, not because I'm totally against vaccines, but uh, I don't like having, you know, foreign substances injected into my body that I don't think I need. That's just where I'm at. I'm, I'm not saying that they do harm. They might do harm. Uh, there are certainly a lot of people who think that some of the past vaccines have caused harm, uh, like sudden in infant death syndrome and so forth. Um, there are, we know, uh, complications with some vaccines. Uh, we don't know what, what ones are going to be arising because of this uh, COVID vaccine because it's still experimental. Uh, it's interesting. Everyone who's getting the vaccine is getting an experimental vaccine. It has not been tested for four years like every other vaccine does. Uh, and after four years of use, they feel like they can kind of uh, guess what it's going to do or not have to guess. They can observe a pattern. But if you're in the, if you're in the alpha group getting the, the first testing, then you're strictly speaking uh, a guinea pig for what's an experimental vaccine. And to call it experimental is not saying anything negative about it. All vaccines are experimental when they first make them. But, I, you know, if I were to take any vaccine, and I don't usually take them, uh, I, would, uh, I would prefer to take one that has uh, been experimented on animals and maybe, <laughs> maybe other people who wanted to volunteer earlier on, uh, especially when I don't see any need for it. I mean, I've already had COVID. My wife had it. A lot of people I know have had it, and frankly, we're not badly affected by it. So, uh, I I know, uh, you know, I know there's not that much for me to be afraid of, of with COVID, and, it, and even if it killed me, I'm not afraid of that either. I'm not afraid to die. So, I mean, why should I put an unknown thing in my body that I don't know what it's going to do to me? Um, I, that's just me. But see, I don't have any conspiracy theory ideas about, for example, the shingles vaccine or the flu vaccine. Uh, or even the polio vaccine. However, I know personally of people who've gotten all those vaccines and then got the disease afterwards. So, you know, it's just, uh, if it's not going to guarantee that you won't get the disease, well, it's not very likely I'm going to suffer from the disease anyway. You know, you get the disease, there's one chance in a thousand you'll die if you're in a high risk group. But uh, that doesn't seem to be very dangerous. Uh, not much more dangerous than the flu itself. And people die from that too. Or from getting in a car and driving on the freeway. People die from that too. Uh, life is full of risks. And I don't really want, uh, you know, experimental substances put into my veins uh, to avoid uh, something that doesn't strike me as a very high risk if I don't have the vaccine. So I'm, that's where I'm at. I, as far as any inside knowledge of, uh, you know, antichrist uh you know, nanobots being injected into your arm to change your DNA and to change your thinking and make you less than human. I, I have to say I have some doubts about that, but then I don't claim to be expert on those things. So that's not something I pay a lot of attention to. I do know this, that if people have, have taken a vaccine um, because they thought it was the right thing to do, uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says they shouldn't, which means they do it innocently. Um, well, then... Uh, I can't see how how that would ever be held against them by God. I mean, if somebody secretly put some kind of a poison in my drink and I die, I didn't commit suicide, even though if I hadn't taken the drink, I wouldn't have died. It's just not, I didn't do it knowingly. Uh, so I, I would not think that anyone should say, if you take a vaccine and something that you, you know, something very uh, 
major happens to you to change you know, your very nature, but you didn't know it, well, that's not the kind of thing God will hold you responsible for. Um, so those are my, my musings on the subject. Okay, I suppose if, uh, though, if, uh, you know, God is speaking through Julie, then he has warned us. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if he is, I've never heard of her. Uh, I, I don't personally, uh, I have to say there are prophets. Uh, well, I don't know if there are prophets, but there are people who God gives prophetic words to. They may not be held the office of a prophet. Uh, but I haven't heard very many prophetic words that, uh, that I thought were, you know, very convincingly, you know, mm -hmm. from God. I think that uh, there'd be some conviction uh, uh, of, of spiritual people about these things if it was a moral issue. Anyway, I'm, you know, that's, I, I admittedly say that's something I don't know very much about. Uh, nor... right, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Th thank you, Carl, for your call. Good talking to you. Okay. Um, Cliff from San Francisco, California. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a first-time caller. And, boy, I tell you, it's definitely one spirit with the Lord. I tell you that much because what I'm about to ask you is right in the vein with the rest of your callers, okay? Uh -huh. I'm in a conundrum. And pretty much ever since I've been saved, I've been questioning how can a person who call themselves a Christian vote for the Democratic Party? with all the anti-Christ, all the anti-everything about these people. How could anybody in their right mind who call themselves a Christian vote for that party? Well, um, you know, every time I... People do ask me that question from time to time, and, and no matter what I say, I'm going to get hate mail. Uh, <laughs> I, I am neither a Democrat... <laughs> Nor a Republican. Me I, I, I don't, either. I, I'm just, I don't I'm a, just a person that has a very okay. discerning spirit. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Exactly. And exactly. That's now, what I'm saying. So if I say you know, something, if I say something against uh, the Democratic Party, uh, I'm going to get all kinds of hate mail from I'm people. I'm talking who about think, their stance. I'm not talking about them as a people. I'm talking about the things that they stand for. Yeah, I understand, and uh, I'm just saying the mail I'm going to get is from people who don't yeah. understand much. But let me just and, say that the uh, you know, I'm not saying anything for the Republican Party if I say something against the Democratic Party, because the party and its stand is what I'm talking about. Now, the Republican Party is not you know, very righteous either. There are some people in the uh, Republican Party and some who are not in it, uh, some who are libertarians and so forth, that probably uh, stand closer on many issues than others do. A lot of Republicans don't uh, stand very close to where I stand on things. So, so I'm, not, I'm not being partisan here. But I am saying that I understand your question, because the, the Democratic Party has gone very far left. Uh, they, are not, they don't advocate for the lives of, uh, of the unborn or even the born. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of Democrats out there who say, well, we, we don't believe in infanticide of a child that's been healthily born and just let them die. Well, you don't, but your party does. That's the thing. Uh, and the question is, this is why I think Christians should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If I identify myself as a Republican or as a Democrat, I'm identifying myself with, with a group of people who mostly are not Christians and with their agenda. If I vote for them, then I'm voting for their agenda. I can say, well, I don't agree with abortion, but I, I'm kind of a democratically thinking person. Well, if you vote for them, you're voting for abortion. There's just no question about that. Uh, now, I, people write to me and say, well, the Republicans haven't stopped abortion either. Well, shame on them. That's on them. Uh, and I wouldn't. But I, I don't know of any Republican that's running on a pro-abortion platform. That is a different thing. I, I could vote for a candidate, Republican or Libertarian or some other kind, if, if they are not advocating evil, okay? But I, uh, but I would not, as a Christian, be able to vote for someone who advocates evil. Now, a lot of people who write to me whenever this comes up say, you're, you're just kind of a one-issue person. You only care about abortion. And my thought is, yeah, well, no, no it's not. There's quite a few other issues, too. I disagree, I disagree with the Democratic Party on, on every, almost every leftist agenda item they have, but... I'm not ashamed to say abortion is the big one because that's murder. Murder is one of the biggest crimes anyone can commit or advocate. And 
you know, to me, abortion is as much a blot on this nation as Hitler killing six million Jews was a blot on Germany. Uh, it's murder. And murder is a big issue. And I don't care how many other issues there are. If murder is on the, is on the uh, ballot, I'm going to vote against it. You know, uh, and that's simply being a Christian. That's not, that's not being a Republican or even a conservative. It's just being a Christian saying human life is not to be murdered unjustly. And, uh, and there are, you know, the Democratic Party, its, it's official agenda is pro-abortion. Now, if someone said, well, you know, Hitler, you know, he did a lot of good things. You know, he had uh, socialized medicine. Uh, he, he had a lot of good things he did for the country. Uh, therefore, I would vote for him, even though he killed six million Jews. Why, why should I make killing six million Jews the whole issue of whether I vote for him or not? Well, I would make it the whole issue. If I, if I knew he was planning to kill six million Jews and he was up for election, I don't care how many good things I thought he was standing for. If he's going to kill the Jews, I'm not going to vote for him. And, and if someone says, how can you make that a, a, a one-issue thing for you? Well, because murdering six million Jews is a terrible, terrible thing, and, and nothing good that a man would do could outweigh that horror. As I said, the Bible says uh, nothing can cleanse a nation from the innocent bloodshed except the blood of those who committed the crime. Uh, so that's God. That's how God sees it. A nation that has innocent blood on its hands is stained and defiled before God and cannot remedy it until those who shed the blood have been killed. Now, I'm not advocating uh, you know, anyone going out and killing abortion uh, doctors. I'm just saying that's what the Bible says about a land. And if, if, you, if I say, well, that's a big issue. To me, that's a very big issue. If someone says, well, it may be a big issue, but there's other issues, why do you make that the main one? Because human life is the main one. And uh, the very fact that some Christians can ask me that question shows how far from Christianity they've drifted in their thinking. Why, why do you care if you know, a million babies a, a, a year are murdered? Well, uh, why? Because uh, murder is a really bad thing. I mean, think of how many protests there have been in cities for a handful, literally, you know, 19 in a year of uh, unarmed black uh, people who were shot by police unjustly. That's that's it's unjust for police to shoot, an, uh, you know, uh, an innocent person. Now, by the way, being unarmed doesn't mean you're not dangerous. It doesn't mean you're not a criminal. But the truth is, if we take all the people who were shot, uh, uh, the black people who were not armed, who were shot by police in the year 2019, I believe the number was 14 or 19, something like that, certainly less than 25. And yet, when we're killing a million babies uh, who are entirely harmless every year, I don't really see why I should be marching, uh, tearing down buildings and, and burning buildings over, you know, sadly, a, a few bad cases of injustice and doing nothing about a horrendous, glaring evil of killing innocent people, blacks and whites. By the way, most babies aborted are black uh, because uh, the abortion clinics are disproportionately set up in uh, the inner city and minority neighborhoods. So, uh, first of all, uh, Margaret Sanger, who started Planned Parenthood, she stated very directly that we need to have abortion in these areas because she wanted to eliminate black people. But Black Lives Matter doesn't care about that. Doesn't, that I mean, that's outright racism. They want to make it racism if a criminal who is shot happens to have been black, but that wasn't an issue in his being a criminal or being shot. Uh, a white criminal would have been shot in the same circumstance. But if he happened to be black, they want to make that an issue. But they don't want to make an issue that there's deliberate genocide of black babies taking place in the inner cities. And that was deliberate. It's not an accident. Margaret Sanger stated that as her goal when she uh, started Planned Parenthood. So, I mean, people can just be blind if they want to. Uh, if they really don't like uh, you know, their political opponents, they may shut their eyes to the evils of their own party. But uh, people who follow Jesus don't believe in shutting their eyes to evil, and they certainly don't believe in voting for it. So I, I share your sentiments. I don't see how they you can know. do that. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Uh, this website I want you to look at, okay? It's called AmericasFrontlineDoctors.com. I've seen it. I've seen it. You've seen it? You've seen, seen it? There. You know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about then. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Uh, 
In fact, um, uh, my, my dad took ivermectin, which was recommended mm-hmm. on that site, when he had COVID, mm-hmm. and he recovered very quickly. Well, v- exactly. fairly quickly. And he was 95 years old. Hey, yeah. I need to take another call, but I appreciate your concerns and your bringing them up. Uh, Kathy from Ontario. Now, is that Ontario, California, or Canada? Canada. Hi. Welcome. Thank you, Steve, for taking my call. I really uh-huh. enjoy your show. I hear it at at 9.30 on WDCX in the Ontario area. Great. But my question is this. Um, I'm going to a church that I'm not a member of right now, but they have a class to introduce you into the history of the church and everything. Uh, it's a Baptist church. It's, you know, an uh-huh. ordinary local church. I'm not sure. going to say the name. But anyway, um, they uh, are asking me that if I if I choose to be a member, I will have to go through a process where I sit in front of a, uh, the elders as an interview, in an interview, and um, I might have to be signing some kind of agreement contract of some sort. Is that a normal process to be a member of a church? Well, maybe some churches, but it's not scriptural. In the early church, if a person repented and was baptized, uh, and they sometimes did so at the moment they heard the gospel. I mean, on, on day of Pentecost, 3,000 people heard the gospel and they repented and were baptized in that same day. Uh, there was obviously no no uh, inquiry made into their private lives. They they got baptized saying that they wanted to follow Jesus. And if they didn't follow Jesus, as if they lived in horrible sin or something afterwards, there was such a thing as church discipline. Someone who had been added to the church on the basis of their honest profession of faith and baptized was was accepted uh, and, you know, benefit of the doubt. Now, again, some people did kind of enter the church, like Ananias and Sapphira, who, who seemed to not really be honest people. Of course, God excommunicated them, but the church is supposed to excommunicate people who will not live by Christ's standards. But you don't wait until you discover how, you know, how much they agree with you, uh, all the things that they're doing in their private life before you let them be in the church. This is something that churches sometimes do now because they look at church membership in an unbiblical way. The Bible says that uh, the Holy Spirit adds us to the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church. Now, in any given town, there's lots of little groups called churches, but they are not the body of Christ. They may be part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a global phenomenon that doesn't have any denominational name or affiliation. It is simply made up of all who are true disciples of Jesus, who have his spirit and are his body. And uh, now in your town, there's probably several Baptist churches, if it's a sizable town. Um, there might there's probably some Presbyterian and Methodist and, and Nazarene and Pentecostal and Calvary chapels and Lutherans and other kinds of churches there too. Uh, none of them is the church. The church is the, the total body of Christ worldwide. And there are, there's a sampling of Christians in your town. Now, unfortunately, this sampling doesn't see itself as one body. It sees itself as uh, several competing corporations, 501c3 Mm -hmm. corporations. And and they want to make sure that the people who go to their group are really on the same page with them so that they don't gravitate towards one of the competing uh, 501c3s in town. That sounds very cynical, and it is, uh, but frankly, it's true. I mean, anyone who says, you can't be a member of this church unless you agree with all of our doctrines— until we have investigated your life, uh, well, then that simply has no biblical basis. Uh, it's it's a membership thing, sort of like being a member of Costco. You know, only only Costco makes it easier. They just charge money. Uh, they don't care what you, what you're living like or what you believe. But it's like they want to own you in a way that other churches don't. I mean, if 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 a church says, "Why don't you become a member of our church?" What if you said, "Well, I'm I'm not against it, but I." You know, I, I want to be a member of all the churches. Is that okay? Well, they wouldn't know what to say about that because they, they don't have a concept of true bi- church membership. Ch- church membership is when you're born again, the Holy Spirit makes you part of the body of Christ. Regardless yeah. regardless where you worship, regardless of what label is over the door of the place that you go on Sundays, uh, you know, you're part of the body of Christ because God made you part of the God, body of Christ, not because some group of elders make you a part of their organization. Uh, or their particular brand. Uh, I, now, I'm not I'm not critical of Baptists per se. I, I was raised Baptist. I've been a Baptist. I was Baptist the earliest years of my life, and I, I got saved as a Baptist. Oh. But I'm saying that Baptists 
are no better or worse than anyone else if, uh, in terms of their wrong views of church membership. If they think that you have to join one church, theirs, in that town, rather than be part of the whole body of Christ, then they don't have a, a line of Scripture to go on. In fact, they're going against what the Scripture says. That's, what, that's kind of what was happening in Corinth. Uh, Corinth only had one church when Paul founded it, but now they're starting to divide when Paul left. And some saying, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas. In other words, they're starting uh-huh. to start be loyal to different denominations and different uh-huh. teachers. And Paul said, what? Is Christ divided? Paul couldn't even understand that mentality. There was just uh-huh. no place for that mentality in his understanding. And yet it's, you know, we're like, we're, we're frogs born in the kettle when it's already boiling. <clears throat> so we don't notice it, I guess. Uh, but the thing is, uh, yeah, you you can attend a church like that if there's a good, you know, if it's good worship, if it's good teaching, if it's a good fellowship. I, I, I'm not against going to a church like that. But if, if membership involves uh, them grilling you, uh, then I'm not sure membership is that desirable. And and God doesn't require you to be a member of one of these churches. No. There's nothing, nothing of it in the Bible. Yeah. In Matthew 5, isn't there something that Jesus says about oaths, taking oaths? Your yes be yes and your you no know, be no. Well, yeah, Jesus did discourage Anything us else from... Anything else is of evil? Right, exactly. He did discourage us from taking oaths. And uh, yeah, if a church makes you sign what they call a church covenant, sometimes you hear of this, uh, yeah. I'd walk the other way, go away, you know, find another place. Because what they mean is you sign this and you are ours. You don't belong to Christ anymore who might let you attend... Uh, various churches. I mean, if you, uh, what if what if you join their church and you just feel like Jesus is leading you to go to another church uh, in town, or or to or or you know whatever, or to give your money to another church or a missionary that isn't that church? Well, usually the church covenant is kind of against that. So, yeah. what the, a church covenant is basically saying: we own you more than the other churches in town do. This is an oh. exclusive. We're in competition with them for you. And you're signing your name. To, it's sort of like marriage. I mean, uh, uh-huh. you know, if, if you've got uh, three men courting the same woman, the guy who gets her to sign a marriage covenant with him, uh, he wins and the others lose. And she doesn't belong to the others at all. She belongs to him. And that's good for marriage. <laughs> marriage is that way. But we don't get married to a church. No. Uh, I mean, if, if, you were actually, if it was actually uh, analogous to marriage that you are in this church instead of another one, and that's like your husband— well, then you could never leave that church justly without being similar to a divorce. You know, there's, that's ridiculous. Uh, these are man-made rules that are governing man-made organizations. Yeah, I didn't not, think it was biblical, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, every 501c3 is a man-made organization. And I'm not saying that to be critical of it because I, I go to churches that are man-made organizations sometimes. But to recognize that that's what they are, that they are man-made organizations— and they are not the body of Christ. The body of Christ, the true body of Christ overlaps their membership probably. There are some in their membership that are part of the body of Christ. And there are some who are not. And there are some who are part of the body of Christ who are in other churches. So if they make you be loyal to the organization instead of to the body of Christ, well, then they are doing exactly what Paul condemned in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They're saying, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas. I'm of the Baptist, right. I'm of the Presbyterians, you know. Hey, I'm out of time, but I just, uh, I appreciate your call, and I really am thank sorry you. that all, thank you, uh, all of our lines are full right now, but we don't, we've run out of time, my apologies. We do this every day so that we can get in as many as we can. So join us again Monday. If you're in Temecula area, join us tomorrow. You go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and see where our meetings are held. If you'd like to help donate, you can write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593, or go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. Have a good weekend, and let's talk again Monday.